Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation's Wellness Wednesdays webinar. I'm Krista Ellis, Community Engagement Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues Annie Brooks, Laura Cameron, Danielle Agpolo, and Grace Bassler. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with and impacted by Parkinson's disease. There's much to be explored and shared in this journey of Parkinson's disease, and for today, we will stick to the needs of our care partners or those living with someone um, affected and diagnosed by Parkinson's disease. Please know that we are recording today's presentation. It will be archived on the Foundation's webpage and YouTube channel. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's recording and other resources in the coming days. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, Expert Briefings, and our Spanish language programming, Episalud en Casa. Join us for our next Wellness Wednesday on November 29th to understand the why for participating in Parkinson's research. We will learn the basics of clinical research as well as the benefits of participating. And we'll also explore what to expect and how to get involved in Parkinson's research. We'll also hear about how people with Parkinson's and their care partners are being involved in the research design process. You can find out more and register for our PD Health and Home events at parkinson.org slash PD Health. The Parkinson's Foundation has a learning lab with free courses to explore and dive deeper into the subjects of Parkinson's disease. We offer a care partner program that is a series of self-paced online courses designed with care partners in mind. This course is built for care partners of people with Parkinson's, including both primary and secondary care partners from diagnosis through advanced Parkinson's. You can learn more and explore the other resources the Parkinson's Foundation's Learning Lab offers by visiting the link on the slide. All the resources and opportunities I have highlighted will be shared with you in a post-event email. So today we will explore keeping the secret of our loved one's diagnosis. First, we will hear from Kelly McWilliams, a nurse practitioner at Corewell Health. And following Kelly's opening, we will hear from two peers who kept their spouse a secret for years and will learn how that impacted their life and relationships. Kelly, thanks so much for getting us started today. Thank you for having me. Give me one moment, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. How are we looking? Looks great, Kelly, thanks. Great. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly McWilliams. I'm a nurse. I support Parkinson's care at Corwell Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you for joining our Parkinson's Anonymous discussion today. Today we are talking about keeping a Parkinson's diagnosis a secret from others. Perhaps you are a spouse or a significant other, family member or friend of someone diagnosed with Parkinson's who does not want their diagnosis shared with others. In turn, you may be navigating an emotionally difficult situation alongside your person with Parkinson's. Perhaps you want to respect your loved one's privacy and wishes, but you also want to help them through this difficult emotional process. So this topic is really important because it is something that everyone diagnosed with PD will face, considering who they want to share with, when, why, and how. And additionally, in the medical practice setting, it's something that's often overlooked. Um, the provider might not pointedly ask a question about this in a visit, or the care team might not, and a patient might not ever bring it up. So it's really helpful that we are considering this discussion today. Um, so with this, we hope our dialogue provides some helpful insights and perspectives for you to consider as you navigate your own course in helping your person with PD consider when to share their diagnosis. 
So first, I just want to acknowledge, uh, we all know that Parkinson's is a life-changing diagnosis for your person with PD, as well as for the care partner. Um, people have openly shared with me as uh, I'm a nurse, many of their thoughts and emotions to feel safe opening up to me and share what they're going through. So it's been quite a privilege to learn this from um, individuals. They've shared they have disbelief and confusion and denial and anger um, with the diagnosis. And then on the flip side, people will share they have resilience and optimism and they feel relief to know uh, they have an explanation for their symptoms with this diagnosis. So a big range of thoughts, feelings, and emotions in response to a diagnosis. And that's for the person with Parkinson's and for the care partner. So understandably, most people share with me that they feel a combination of all of these things. Um, unfortunately, we see that the more challenging thoughts and emotions when facing a new diagnosis can create some significant barriers for people to really move forward with their diagnosis, um, move towards acceptance, and then open up to share it with others. It's quite a process, of course. Um, so I'm hoping that some of the lessons learned from people living with Parkinson's and other care partners I can share with you here today, and you can take away some good considerations. So there are many reasons one may opt to keep their diagnosis a secret. Um, commonly, people will tell me that they just don't want to be looked at differently. Um, they have some embarrassment or even shame with having the diagnosis. Um, they don't want things to change and that's understandable. They were happy with what their life was doing and what it was and this is not what was planned. So um, it's, it's hard to face. Uh, they report fears, you know, they worry about what this means for them individually um, as well as their family. There are fears of the future a future that they thought they were going to have and now it looks very different and there are more unknowns. So as a result, people may choose to avoid facing this because it's understandably very difficult. And in turn, they don't want to share it with others if they're not even facing it themselves um, quite yet. So while all of these thoughts and feelings are very normal and to some degree, we all would probably experience in some way, um, we want to also help people through this and um, help them consider, you know, the benefits of sharing and some of the risks that come with not sharing. So I highlighted here on my slide a few things that is not only supported in some of the literature, but also just, again, my conversations and interactions with people. Um, when we don't share and we keep it in, we are at risk for impairing our relationships and really trust with others. I have unfortunately met many people who have not disclosed their diagnosis um, to let's say their adult children or their siblings or other people that they're close with. And maybe they found out years later and those people really felt blindsided. Um, they've shared with me that, you know, they felt that um, it did have an impact on the trust of the relationship. Um, also, keeping things in is shown to increase stress, which leads to increased worry and anxiety, which can lead to sleep problems. So all of these things build on each other. Um, we also are at increased risk for more anger or kind of outbursts, sort of lashing out for unknown reasons, um, depression, and then even isolation, where maybe we don't want to go out and do things because people don't know, you know, that you have Parkinson's and they don't really know why you might be walking or talking different or your hand is shaking. So maybe the choice is to isolate and avoid those things instead of going out and letting people know what you're dealing with. Um, as a result, we know that stress really worsens all symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So in turn, it's actually potentially really worsening the disease and the symptoms that manifest. So these are some um, increased risks that we see that come with keeping something in and keeping it a secret. So we want to acknowledge these things and that while it's very normal to hold something in and not want to face it, 
there are some real um, health consequences to doing so. On the flip side, we want to look at what does sharing a diagnosis look like? The first thing I want to acknowledge is just a you need time and patience. Um, it's for not only your person with Parkinson's, but for yourself. This is a life-changing event and um, you need to take that time for yourself individually as a support person, as well as for your person with Parkinson's to process what this means. Um, we don't have a rigid timeline. You know, what, what that timeline is for each person is different. So. Um, give yourself some grace and time and patience with the processing. Um, and understand that um, the person with PD is going to need some extra support emotionally. You know, if there are outbursts and sadness and isolation, that's because what they're facing is really difficult. So having that understanding of how challenging this is for them, and they might not be ready to just jump in and tell everybody, um, will really help them. So having that patience as their loved one and support person, even though you have your own fears and worries and trying to talk openly together about your shared fears and worries. Um, if it's difficult to address, you know, we encourage you to talk to your doctor. Um, it could be your neurologist, it could be your primary care, but let somebody who you feel safe with, sometimes it's me as a nurse, Get it out there that you guys are struggling. Um, your person is struggling and you need help. So talking to the doctor, talking to even a counselor if needed could be very helpful. Just wanna reinforce some positive aspects that come with sharing. Then these are things that as a care partner, as you work through these, these topics, you can reinforce some of the benefits as well. One, because people say they feel relieved, they share, and even though it's very scary, it's a big weight that comes off of them. I've heard that so many times that a weight has been lifted. So with that becomes, you know, comes a lift of stress and hopefully worry and those negative consequences that I mentioned on the last slide. With sharing, people have said they've grown to accept their own diagnosis more as they start to share with others they've grown to accept within themselves what they're facing slowly more over time. They've also expressed really deep, meaningful connections have come out of sharing. So um, surprisingly, you can really strengthen relationships in your families um, and even more spiritual relationships can um, come into play for some people if you open up and start sharing, you really foster more meaningful connections um, with others because you're facing something so profound, so life-changing, you can really develop more meaningful connections out as an outcome. You do foster trust. As I mentioned, you know, when we don't share things with people in general, we um, tend to not have as much trust. There's an underlying sort of distrust going on. And when you share, you do foster trust and more connection. When you share, you open up yourself up and your loved one, you and your family are open to receiving more support. So it, whether you need support now or in the future, um, support, it, you're more willing to accept support and receive support. And you might be surprised at how much people want to support you and offer support. Um, certainly, when you share, you're opening yourself up to more acceptance and learning. And when you learn more about Parkinson's, we hope that some of the fears you have, we can um, help you through because some fears are just fears of unknown, right? And if you don't know what you're facing, it's really scary. But when you start to face it and you confront some of those fears, you might learn you can do things about um, some of your symptoms, really positive things. And so you really encourage improved self-care um, by embracing learning. And you can learn more when you start to open up and share with others. And then certainly you open yourself to new experiences. Um, I've met so many people who just developed new friendships, created new groups, exercise groups, support groups, just different networks, um, got into research and got in whole new networks from different avenues they explored. 
that they never would have explored had they not opened up themselves up and started to share. So I'm highlighting some things here that I've learned as a nurse in working with so many patients and families. And these are things that you could potentially take away as you support your loved one in how they may face um, their own sharing of their diagnosis. Just a couple of considerations before I hand things over. Um, take some time, of course, to process what this means for yourself, as well as your person with Parkinson's. Um, before you know, sharing with others, we encourage learning what is Parkinson's and what is it not. The more you learn, the more you're empowered to share what you guys are facing together. And you can you know, dispel myths that people might have. They might think Parkinson's is just shaking or they might think it's just an old person's disease when in fact it's not. So the more you learn about it, the more you're able to feel equipped to share and answer questions that people may have. And then um, as mentioned initially, just reflect on um, and plan, you know, consider all these health benefits that I have mentioned, support your loved one with recognizing some of these benefits to sharing and um, help your person with Parkinson's reflect on the support and the positive relationships that may develop as a result. And then discuss openly the worries, your worries, their worries. They're really hard to discuss, but the more you get them on the table and you start really talking about them, perhaps the more together you can address what those worries are and take some steps um, towards addressing them instead of avoiding them. Also just consider together who you want to share with, you know, who are the ones you feel like you'll get the most support from and who are the ones that you feel the biggest worries with sharing? Is it an employer or something else? So that you together can face how you might share with those people um, and plan ahead what you want to say. You know, the more planned you are, the more you understand, the easier it will be to share. You are in control of those conversations and you can help your loved one in navigating some conversations. Some people will say, you know, they prefer a one-to-one -one conversation and others will um, even consider supporting their loved one in writing a letter or an email that they might wanna share with people to give them time to reflect before having a face-to-face -face that could be more emotional. So these are just some considerations I've learned in my nursing experience and I wanna share with you. Um, there's not a one size fits all and we know that. So um, consider exploring resources that may help you. Uh, we're all here today and this is a resource um, in itself. Um, there are online forums where you can converse with other uh, care partners people who are facing um, similar circumstances. So PD conversations and the PD buddy network online are good options. Um, consider one-to-one -one connections. There's nothing like learning from somebody who's in your position. Talk to your doctor, talk to the Parkinson's Foundation or the Davis Finney Foundation. There are ways to talk to other care partners who've been in your shoes and can help you navigate um, the situation and support groups, books, podcasts are all really great um, options as well. So I thank you so much for your time today. I'm gonna pull my slides down here and turn things over, I believe, to Julia next. Julia, thanks so much for being here today and having the courage to share how keeping Phil's secret impacted your life as his loved one um, closest to him in this journey of being diagnosed with Parkinson's. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience when your husband, Phil, was diagnosed with Parkinson's? I didn't understand that this was a disease, a progressive disease that would, could or would possibly progress and it would be a visible progression. So um, at first, just, you know, I don't mind saying ignorance, um, confusion, then the question, why? Why him? Why did this happen? Are you sure? 
Um, when can you tell us that you're sure about this? What do we do? That was the next thing. So, so how do we cure this? You know, how do we fix it, not cure it? Because at the time I was not thinking cure. I was thinking, how do we fix this? How did it feel for you to not speak to someone about all of this that you and Phil were going through? Oh, goodness. As are you asking, speak to a professional or just speak to people in general about it? Because both options were closed off to me, both. One, because Phil did not, one, he didn't understand it. Two, he was like, this is not happening to me. So there is a full gambit of non-acceptance and non-acceptance coupled with what is this is a downward spiral to disaster um total frustration depression shut down shut off we began to just really distance ourselves from from people that we would like go out to dinner with, go bowling with, go to movies with, you know, our church family and 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 the folks that were closest to us that would pick up these subtle changes in him, we stopped associating with them. And it wasn't a gradual back away. It was like boom, nobody. Phil would talk to me and he'd say things like, this isn't, this really isn't happening. I don't know what this is. He'd be so frustrated, so angry. And I go, well, honey, how do we find out? Which helped because he then got on the computer and he started researching it. And we would, we talk a little bit. He would say, do you know, like, do you know that um, the medicine I'm being treated with is not really changed in the last 20, 30 years? And I went, uh, okay and he'd say stuff like i don't see and this is this is really important i don't see anyone who looks like me with this disease and i went what so okay now you not only have the stigma of a disease that you don't understand you also have that stigma of i'm the only one and I'm like, surely, surely not, surely not. And he says, look. And so he's showing me page after page after page of person, person, person. They're not, they're not black people. They're not even females. And he says, what is this? And, and you know, his question was, am I being punished for something? Or what did I do? And I said, oh my goodness, no. This is a sickness now, and I know I'm going to veer a little bit, but I need you and probably anyone listening to this to understand, yes, he's going through something that's epic and life changing, but I was also going through a terrible ordeal myself. I was classified as morbid obese. So I was dealing with that, the health issues that surrounded it, and then telling myself not to be so selfish, thinking about myself, but not feeling well as well. So don't think about yourself. You need to help your husband. So we had, there was so many things feeding into this, and it was frustration, depression on both of our sides, um, hearing things like you should be able, and this is personally for me, you should be able to deal with this, deal with your health issues and help your husband. Well, I can't help my husband because I don't understand what I'm helping him with. So thinking about how you dealt with it, Julia, what were your primary supports when the diagnosis was still being kept? fairly secret, what did you do to support yourself? I journaled a lot. 
And the beauty of journals, here's the beautiful beauty of journals. You can say anything you want to say. You can rail, you can scream, you can do it all in that book. And here's a big tip for that. After you've done it, step away and refresh yourself, breathe, go for a meditative walk. I did that quite a bit. I have two other questions I'd like to ask, and it's going to be talking to your daughters about it. Feel as a husband bigger than life. Feel as a daddy. Oh, bigger than life. My hero. There's nothing that daddy can't do. There's nothing that daddy can't fix. So all of a sudden we have daughters that are in grad school, daughters that are, you know, um, they're in their own profession and they're asking daddy, daddy, you were in human resources. How would this type answer or how would this request be to you? Well, when you ask daddy that question and daddy sits there and he's blinking his eyes and it takes him a minute and a half, maybe two minutes to come back to you with an answer, they start to go, what's wrong with daddy? Because daddy was like hitting. You know, you ask him a question, boom, boom, boom. He had answers for you. He had so many options that you go, oh my gosh, just give me one. Give me the best option, dad. So um, the questions came to me, mom, what's wrong with dad? Well, girls, I really need to talk to you. Daddy has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Parkinson's, what's that? So we go through talking about it. I give them the same placard planners that I've been given. And I said, I need you to read about it. What I can tell you is that his ability to move, his ability to process, um, even his ability to be around us will be affected. And they're like, ah, so is that why he goes, girls, please just stop, stop. We would... I mean, it's three women. We're talking. We're, you know, going back and forth and feels like sometimes he's freaking out. Please, please, guys, just please stop. Stop. I'm like, well, what is wrong with you? Well, too many conversations coming from too many people. He can't process that. Or it's like a thousand bees running by your ears. You can't catch anything but that sound. And because you can't catch it, you get frustrated and your frustration comes out with inability to cope with the sounds and stuff. And you're like, please just be quiet. So we found ourselves tiptoeing around. Don't say that. Let's not, you know, let's just go somewhere, the three of us, and we can be what we were before daddy got sick. You know, so it it affected our family dynamics from the point of I need advice from you, daddy, to just being in the same house, eating a meal, sitting down, watching a TV program. You almost had to be silent. There was you can't talk. You can't get up and move too much because then his focus is taken from the program. And if his focus is taken from the program and he really can't follow what you're doing, it's frustration. And it comes out as him agitated and really not wanting to be there with you. And that wasn't the case, but we didn't understand it. So to get the full understanding Thank you, Julia, for sharing, you know, how the dynamic of the family changed over time. And it it sounded like, um, you know, there came a point where you you just you guys couldn't keep it from your daughters any longer. And they were noticing the progressive changes with daddy, with Phil, and that you had no choice but had to share with your girls that he did, in fact, have Parkinson's. And that also meant, you know, changing the interactions with dad. So. 
balancing and adjusting your time together with Phil to find balance and having that quality family time together. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how you adjusted the family dynamic to allow Phil to have engaged really beautiful time with his daughters, time with you as his wife, and also balancing less stimulation, less engagement so that um, everyone could live a quality life with the family? As you said, less is more if that makes sense. <laughs> um, instead of three of us being in a room with him, there may be just one. And that one person with Phil would do the things that they were most familiar with. Here's an example. Our youngest daughter loves to cook. Daddy loves to cook. So she and daddy would cook and they would talk. He was comfortable with that. This is a this is something that he likes to do. He knows she likes to do it with him. So he's very comfortable and he doesn't have to worry about presenting uh okay, I'm on it type of thing. This is this is what we do. So they would um they would cook, they would talk and she is a very Francis, this is my youngest daughter. She's a very um, energetic person, kind of like mom. And, um, you know, her voice is high pitched. I noticed her toning it down. I noticed her spacing out her, she would space out what she said and would space it out in such a way that she paints such a clear picture. There was no misunderstanding. She would see it. Daddy's having trouble with this and very, very nicely step in and said, Dad, you know what? I don't quite understand how to do this. Will you talk me through it? But in the process of saying that, she was actually moving things to her spot where she was working. And, you know, maybe not being totally truthful about it, but Daddy, is this the way you do it? Again, he's comfortable. He can respond. And it's a celebration because, oh, yeah, I'm teaching. I'm, you know, I'm doing I'm daddy. You know, I'm that I'm that big, bigger than life person again. So, yes, even though it's a simple question, I'm able to answer and instruct and guide. So, yeah. And uh, now with Megan, um, our oldest daughter, she's more like Phil in her thought processing and what have you. Um, their conversations, and again, you know, thank God for intelligent, perceptive young ladies. She would engage him in conversations that it was okay to take your time and answer because it was not the type question or dialogue that you could speedily pump out an answer to, you'd have to think about it. So thinking, Julia, just, you know, of all the, I call it riding the wave, right? It's just ups mm -hmm. and downs, ups and downs, and learning how to navigate a quality relationship with your daughters, a quality relationship between you and your husband, a quality relationship between your daughters and their dad. It sounds like when, when I, what I just heard that, you know, it was, after you shared with your daughters that Phil had Parkinson's disease, that they learned what would make him more able to engage meaningful, meaning, meaningfully. And they were able to adapt to be able to engage with dad in a, a meaningful way. Is that right? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely right. And, um, and it probably steered them, especially my youngest daughter, probably steered her to her, uh, her profession because as I've said, she is a certified counselor, um, community counseling, family counseling, and she now can suggest things. She says, mom, I can't talk to you on a professional level, but I can give you tools to put in your tool belt to deal with things. She said, that's perfectly allowable. She says, I can tell you who you need to go see, like, or 
more importantly, not so much who, but when it is critical that you guys go talk to someone professionally. Since becoming more open about Phil's diagnosis, how has your life changed? I am doing Zoom recordings right now to educate <laughs> people that look like me, okay? I am very active in the community talking about what's happening. Phil is open to people now. He tells folks, I have Parkinson's. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no, oh, is it contagious? There's nothing like that. We are, the two of us are out. We're out and about. We're speaking to other people of color that have suffered through, are going through, or are going through what we've experienced. And we're telling them it is okay. It's okay. It is going to be okay. Understand, you're going to change. There's going to be so many changes in your life, but there are tools and medications and people that are here available to you that can help that change, help you manage it. And not only that, help you live a functioning, happy, fulfilling life. Thank you, Julia. I am so grateful for you sharing your story with the Parkinson's community. So heartfelt and it really echoed some of the things I think I shared in my introduction. Um, you talked about some real positives that you experienced. You started with a very difficult diagnosis and journey and how you and your husband had to work through that individually and together. And look at these positives that came in, in spite of having a difficult diagnosis. You talked about opportunities that opened up. Um, you engaged in education. You're raising awareness, not only for Parkinson's in general, but for Black people living with Parkinson's. And like you said, there are women, there are young people. So we want to really uh, make sure people are not alone in this and that your quality of life was able to be improved as a result. So just a really heartfelt story. And we appreciate um, that you came to share that awareness and experience with the community. Thank you, Kelly. And now we will hear from Marlene Perdan. Marlene, thank you so much for joining us today. It is, it's been such a pleasure working with you over the years and now getting to highlight the true reality of what it's like to keep Bill's secret of living with Parkinson. So if you would, just for a few moments, just share with our community who you are, maybe uh, highlight some things that's going on in your, in your life, and then we can kind of get into the intention of today's program. Okay. Um, my name is Marlene Perdan, and my husband, Bill, um, has Parkinson's and diagnosed in 2009, so about 14 years ago, um, and I've been his care partner the whole time. Um, we uh, recently just moved, and so we're moving closer to our kids and our grandkids, so that's an exciting thing for us. Thanks, Marlene. So thinking about those years ago, 14 years of living with Parkinson's, when Bill received his diagnosis, can you just share what went through your guys' minds, how you felt, and the, how you came to um, deciding to keep it just between the two of you for some time? Um, sure. I do remember it. I remember it well. It was... Um took about a year and a half for Bill to get a diagnosis. He was having some issues with his arm and some fine motor, and he was gone to a neurologist and 
just w didn't get any answers and went for occupational therapy and was, wasn't getting any answers. And so then um, finally, um, he did get to a movement disorder specialist who diagnosed him right away with Parkinson's. But we weren't thinking it was Parkinson's. Uh, we weren't thinking anything like that. And so when it came, it was really quite a shock. And Bill was just turned 51 and I wasn't 50 yet. And so um, it, it was just not something that we were thinking of and not thinking that that was something that we were gonna have to deal with. Like right away, the thoughts go to, oh my gosh, is he not gonna be able to work? How are we gonna live? I had just made the decision to leave my full-time job to start a small business. And so, yeah, none of that was um, optimal at that time. And so we were all really scared. I mean, we were really, we were shocked and then scared. Like, oh, we were so scared. So Bill just um, didn't want to tell anyone. He didn't want to tell anyone at work because he was so afraid of losing his job. It was, he just didn't want anybody to see him differently. And we were both scared because we were like, well, what's going to happen if you can't work? And, um, you know, everything was through him, his insurance, the health insurance, everything. So that was the first, I think, the big, you know, moment of we can't believe this is happening. And then now we can't believe what are we going to do? Um, so that was what initially we were feeling, a lot of uh, disbelief and a lot of um, fear. No, thanks for sharing that. And I know that many of us who are joining today can probably relate to the fear of that initial diagnosis. And also the whirlwind you go through to finally get an answer, right? No matter how impactful that answer was of receiving a diagnosis, um, knowing that it comes with some fear and of course that shock factor. So thank you for sharing, Marlene. And thinking about Bill's work. Um, in our previous conversation, you had shared a little bit about the time leading up to when he decided, when you decided it might have been time to let go of the job. Can you just share a little bit about the trajectory and the path that, you know, for the three or four years that Bill continued to work and what happened during that time? Yeah, so he didn't want to, you know, share any at work. And we told very, very few people. Um, he didn't really want anyone to know and so we told uh, some family his parents um, a few siblings not all of them and um, no friends um, and just just the people you know very very close people and people that we needed to for whatever reason like physicians but um, um, he didn't want to tell anyone at work and so I think at some point he reached out to like a human resource person, but no one, his boss didn't know, his coworkers didn't know. And so for three years, that's how it went. Um, and he was doing fine. You know, I, I, he, he, when he first got diagnosed and he got on some medications and he started exercising and doing all of those things i mean he had been exercising but he was starting to do the parkinson's exercises and all of those things and it really he got to a place where he was doing really well and i couldn't even tell that he had anything anymore so we just kind of like thought oh this is great we'll just keep churning along you know and then um so for about three years but then around year three things started to fall apart it was like somebody hit the brakes and um the meds weren't working as much that i think that's about the time we went on um cinemet and so that was about and i when things started to really kind of fall apart a little bit and i noticed he was getting more tired i noticed he was just off his game he loved his job he was good at his job and it just was starting to i could just tell it just wasn't the same and people were starting to notice people were starting to notice some things you know they were noticing they were asking questions like you know is he okay you know people were later i found out people thought all kinds of things he was drinking he was, was he on drugs was he 
um, you know, did he have MS? Did he have, I don't know, all kinds of things. And I said, you know, this has to stop. You have to have to tell people because they're starting to, I don't want to say make things up, but they're starting to speculate and you don't want, you want to set the record straight. You want to tell people what's really going on. Plus it's just too much for you. You have to start scaling back. So that was about year three. And then he did, he did tell people at work. He did work for about three more years, um, which the last year he did, a, he changed jobs and did sort of a transition job, but probably worked a year or two too many um, in there. But, you know, again, you're scared. And when that's all you know, you're holding on by your fingernails, trying to keep your, your life together. So um, that's what he was trying to do. But it was hard. Um, it's hard not to talk about it. You know, it's hard to keep it all in and and um, not talk about it to people. I didn't tell my friends. I didn't have anybody to talk about it with. Very, very few. Just a couple of the family members. And then we didn't really talk about it either because we didn't want other people to know about it. So you, it, it, yeah, it didn't work very well for me. <laughs> Can you share some of the fears that you had and people finding out? So we had mentioned um, things that you avoided doing in the home um, or even in public that allowed you to hold the secret so closely between you and Bill. Yeah, I mean, I think I told you that I was afraid even to um, put anything in the house, like a pamphlet, a newsletter, you know, anything that said Parkinson's on it. I, I was afraid to like set it down. If I got something like that, I was like, put it away. You know, no one could see it because they they would want to know why is this here? Or it would just set off some flags. So what happens is like, then you avoid, oh, well, don't pick that up because I don't know where I'm going to put it, you know, and then you avoid getting more information. I mean, you can do it even online. You're like, you don't want anybody to see your screen or that you have, you know, how you know how people you know they just look or they see your phone or something pops up or a, you know a reminder you, you're just so paranoid to, you're scared that they're going to see it then they're going to start asking questions uh bill was starting to have some symptoms and shaking and we we're trying our best to kind of like position him so that like they wouldn't see oh put your arm down don't sit that way move over here you know it, it's just, it's just awful. And, um, you know, and then you're not, you're just not talking about it, you know? And then, so then you're not, you're not expressing your feelings and you're not, um, you're just, it's just, you're hiding it. You're hiding the secret. And then all day long, you know, you're dealing with it, but you can't talk about it and you can't share it. And so then you're just going through it by yourself. Um, I think if I had, to do that over, I would have considered um, getting a counselor right away, somebody, you know, that I could talk to that would have been confidential and that I would have been able to, you know, channel that, um, all those feelings that way or and or uh, some type of, you know, support group that would have been a confidential support group because I needed to talk about it. And Bill, we weren't even talking about it to each other you know, that much because we were trying to like hide it. And also if we don't address it that much, maybe it won't be as real as if we keep addressing it, you know, um, I think when you really start addressing it, then, you know, it's for real and it's here and it's not going anywhere. You know, you shared this moment of, um, your mother and how sharp she was <laughs> yeah. you a little bit about that kind of initial initiation if you will of um coming out yeah my mom you know she was in her 80s and she was sick and she you know she stayed sharp until the end and she um she saw you know some of the tremor or whatever was going on and right away she's like what's wrong with bill and i think even at that point i don't even know if we knew we were trying still trying to find out but she was picking up on it you know and i think bill thought that nobody noticed you know and i'm like some people don't notice some people 
notice and don't say because it's not their business and then other people are gonna you know either try to you know ask you about it or speculate you know and then you have the rumors flying and so I think it's really I know it's a hard decision to decide who you tell when you tell and especially with when you're in a working situation um but I think you know keeping it in all in or only with a few people it really wasn't a good plan for me and also thinking about when you and Bill got to a point of realizing that you'd be okay can you talk a little bit about you know when when you took the moments to look at the finances when you took the moments to identify how you can support yourselves and, and start to as you said embrace this diagnosis of living with Parkinson's yeah um I think one of the things I would suggest to people is to look at your situation um right away we we did bury our heads in the sand a little bit we were so afraid and and I think to do that at first isn't necessarily I mean that's just a reaction you know we can't it's too much I can't I can't I can't handle looking at it, all of it right now but I wouldn't have waited as long as we did um I think a suggestion is to take a look at your situation right away because what we found was that it wasn't as scary as we originally thought it might be you know when you think oh well what's going to happen if I lose my job well once we started looking at it let's break out the finances and we talked to some people uh, professionals who were able to sit down and say okay this is what it looks like if Bill stops working tomorrow and this is what it looks like if Bill can work another year and this is what it looks like if he gets disability and this is what it looks like if you know and we had all these different scenarios out there and we could look at them and then it was like oh we can work with this now you know we understand it it may not be optimal it may not be what you thought it was going to be um you know and a lot depends on how young you are and what you do you know um some people can't keep working the job that they're working other people can and so you know it just depends but once we looked at that it took a lot of the fear away and I wish that was something we had done but earlier because then it was like even if we didn't do anything even if we kept working we would have known we would have been okay we're we're okay if we have to do this or this or this we know we know what the plan is we know what adjustments we have to make um all of those types of things or you know or if it's like your home if you have to move or whatever at least you understand it instead of just being so afraid of it which is what we were you know um Bill's job was his career was a big 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 piece of his life and he worked really hard and he was good at it and he did not want to give that up and um so he he was really holding on too tight and then I was too so um but if you really take a look at the situation whatever it is it doesn't I think it takes a lot of the you know what you can you can battle what you know and it's hard to um, fight what you don't know so thank you Marlene for sharing that and I know that so many of us fear um, the uncertainty of finances of the possibility of retiring sooner than we had planned um, and for you bringing light to the possibility of it being okay with a shift and the change so thinking about you know our time together and recognizing that our community is present here who might be holding on to the secret is this is there something you'd like to say to community as we close our time together I would say that for me what I found was holding it in was not a good plan I needed people to talk to I needed um, whether it was counselors or support group your friends it, holding it in and you know dealing with the disease and then keeping it hidden at the same time is just takes too much out of you it takes too much out of you you can't you can't handle the disease you can't put back in to the 
help the person or yourself because you don't have anything left. You're just, you're just hiding. And I'd say, you know, the disease takes so much from you already. We all know that um, life's, you know, life gets changed, dreams change, um, whatever it is, finances change, you know, it doesn't mean it's all bad things. It's just it's changes. And so it takes a lot out of you. I know this is not what we're doing now. Um, this wasn't the plan we had 15 years ago, but it's, it's okay. It's just, um, takes a lot out of you. So I would say, don't let it take more, you know, don't, don't hold back. If you can seek out what you need to, even if you are deciding not to tell people, try to figure out a way to maybe tell some people or get the support you need instead of, you know, and don't be so afraid to, you know, sit down and look at your situation because then once you know that you, you'll feel a lot better. I think you will. Well, thank you, Marlene. That was also extremely heartfelt and just such strong messages that you shared. Um, I think the biggest is that encouraging people, it, it is hard to face fears, I think, for all of us. Um, and so, you know, talking about those fears, maybe writing them down um, and trying to take some steps. Um, it might be little steps. It might take some time, but just taking some steps to face some of those fears. And it actually reduced a lot of the worry and, and was a weight lifted slowly over time. So um, really inspiring. And I hope that message resonated with others here too, um, that it's a process, but you can get through it and seeking help from others. Uh, there's many avenues to seek help. So whether it be your healthcare team, um, asking them, um, getting connected with a counselor, finding support groups, there's a lot of ways that you can talk to people and work through some of these difficult topics. So thank you so much for sharing. Mm, thank you, Kelly. And I'd like to, with the few moments that we have left with our community, a few questions came in. So we'll just jump right into them. Um, one of our attendees has asked, how, how does stress worsen Parkinson's disease symptoms? Stress has been shown um, in various studies to really worsen all of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, we have the motor symptoms, which are the movement symptoms. So think of tremor or slowness or stiffness, but there are also other um, non-visible, non-motor symptoms. Uh, it could be sleep, anxiety, uh, constipation, for example, and stress has been known to um, increase all of those symptoms or worsen them. So really, we know stress isn't good for the body, and Parkinson's um, is a perfect example visibly of how stress can worsen um, the symptoms of disease. Thanks, Kelly. A question from Ron. Is there a best way to disclose or share a diagnosis with loved ones? There's not, unfortunately, a one size fits all because everybody's lives are so different. Um, you know, people have different family dynamics, um, work circumstances. Um, so it is really individual. Um, you know, like we've talked about here today, taking steps with learning. Um, is a big part of things. So you can consider what you want to share and how you share a diagnosis um, and considering the most important people in your life and where you're gonna get the most support um, who will be your advocates. Um, maybe the best people to share with first. Um, your network might be very big or small. So there isn't a a perfect way to do it. There are books and there are resources um, that you can look at to learn from others' experiences. So I would encourage that. Learn from others who've been in your position and something might resonate with you. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, but the more you consider and take in, the more you'll form your own approach to how to share. Thanks, Kelly. And if I may add a little bit to it, there's always this metaphor I like to refer to 
is your hesitancy are you are you approaching sharing your diagnosis is this a mountain that you're about to climb or is it a mole hill and when you take this metaphor of this might be a mountain and really being more mindful of that or this is just a mole hill i can i can i can breeze right through this kind of mm -hmm. analogy Emily shares that her mother was diagnosed six years ago and she has not fully accepted her diagnosis. And the only person that her mother is talking with about her diagnosis is her father. Any advice for how she can approach the subject with her mom? She is living in the same house as her mother and it seems to be quite difficult for um, Emily to hold this secret from her family members. So any advice would be welcomed. Yeah, I think um, making sure you're carving out time to live genuine relationships in your household and then also carve out time to say, hey, we have to have time to talk about Parkinson's. Um, I recommend that for people so it doesn't consume all day every day, but that you're intentionally setting aside time to see how their symptoms are going and talk about the topic of sharing, for example. So um, perhaps, you know, you approach the topic in that way, you know, can we set aside some time to make sure we're, you know, the daughter knows. And so the daughter could say, can we set aside some time to support your Parkinson's and, and so I can help you best. And then, um, with that time, um, she could use that to say, Hey, I think we should talk about some of the benefits of sharing and, you know, why aren't you sharing? And, and the daughter can share her concerns, but, uh, just being a little more intentional and really prepping uh, mom for the conversation and that it's it's ongoing dialogue. Um, but I again, emphasizing those benefits of sharing um, and maybe those negative consequences of not sharing um, would be a good starting point um, and and encouraging these different avenues to connect with others uh, for learning and maybe connecting with other people with Parkinson's as well. Thanks, Kelly. There's mm -hmm. a question from Shelly and also kind of uh, along the same lines from one of our attendees. Is there a type of therapist that a person with Parkinson's or a care partner caring for someone with Parkinson's should see? Is there a certain specialty to look for or perhaps support groups that are specific to care partners? Yeah, um, absolutely. In our setting at Corwell, and this might not be where you are, but we do have a therapist that is very familiar with Parkinson's disease and works in neurology specifically. So you could ask your doctor if that's available in your setting. Um, as with any therapist, it is very individual. So you have to find the right fit for you. Um, there's a lot of different therapy options virtual online as well. So if you go to like psychologytoday.com, um, you can look by zip code and find therapists that way. Not everybody's going to know Parkinson's. So, um, and you might not have access to a Parkinson's specific therapist in your area. So um, access the Parkinson's foundation and call their helpline. They might be able to point you to therapists in your area who are more familiar, um, as well as support groups. Uh, each state should have sort of a Parkinson's, a state-based organization. And so they should have listings of support groups in your area. We offer a care partner support group, as well as a kind of general learn about Parkinson's group. So you might have lots more access to this than you realize. Um, and then we also connect people one-to-one. -one. So my doctors regularly say, hey, Kelly, this patient would benefit from a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody. And we have many people just like Marlene um, did today, you know, is willing to share and is willing to talk. So there's lots of avenues you can explore. Um, and so I think reaching out doctors, Parkinson Foundation and, and support groups would be good avenues as well as counseling. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. take one final question from one of our attendees asking about navigating the holiday events. So their mother mm -hmm. has not necessarily shared the diagnosis with extended families, um, family members or siblings about her diagnosis or their diagnosis. And they've they've chosen to not attend family or social events since 2020. Um, and when people have questions or concerns about her, they, they're not quite sure how to navigate those conversations. So if I understand correctly, the family members that do know, 
um, are having trouble navigating the with the family members that don't know. Um, so yeah, that is very difficult. And I think if um, ideally the goal would be to support and encourage sharing, um, you know, again, emphasizing those benefits. And this could be an example of maybe this is a, a way that sending a letter or something that could explain to family what's going on. If, if it's been so much time um, and so long, it could be even harder as time goes on, right? So uh, reflecting on those benefits and encouraging um, still that sharing could be very beneficial. It's never too late to share. And um, you might be surprised about the positives that come. Um, it'd be maybe really hard to do it in person in a big group, but you could consider one-to-one uh, -one calls before the holidays. You could consider a letter to the different relatives and say, you know, I want to be there and this is why I haven't been there. Um, and that could be a way to express exactly what you want and then encourage them, you know, I'd love to have a one-to-one -one conversation with you. And it sort of frames, you know, gives you a safe avenue to express. Um, and then hopefully those individuals come back to you and understand, and, and then you can attend some of these holiday events that have been missed. So um, that's one uh, potential avenue you could try, but um, again, reinforcing some of those positives that we've heard today, um, and it's never too late. And, and those benefits could be there ongoing. So just keep encouraging that. Great. Thank you, Kelly, so mm -hmm. much for your knowledge today. Really appreciate you helping us build a foundation of understanding why our loved one may be wanting us to keep the secret and also hearing from our peers today on how that secret has impacted them and making the decision to share their diagnosis publicly with family members. We got a comment to um, asking that, you know, we really need to hear from people with Parkinson's disease. Just want to flag that we did uh, do a, a webinar for people with Parkinson's um, who are new to Parkinson's disease. And that webinar was designed for people living with Parkinson's where you hear from people living with Parkinson's and their perspective of how keeping their secret impacted their life, why they kept that secret and so on and so forth. So uh, my colleagues just put that link in the chat. So for closing, I just wanna thank you all for having the courage uh, to be here today, to show up and explore uh, the opportunity of what it means to keep a secret of a chronic illness. So thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Marlene, for your time and, and being vulnerable to share your experience and how it impacted you and hopefully encouraging our community who's here today to make the decision that uh, best fits their needs. If you had a question today that you were not ready to submit or perhaps are seeking more support uh, that Kelly might have mentioned, please reach out to our helpline by calling 1-800-4PD-INFO. You can also email helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact information to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital safety kit. We thank you for joining us today and hope to see you again soon in Zoom land. Until then, be well.